We're in week two of this series called It Is This the End? And last week, we answered that question. And uh, if you weren't here, the, the answer is, I don't know, but um, we're closer than we've ever been. And if you, uh, if you weren't here last week, I just encourage you to go back and watch that. We are continuing in this series today, and we're in week two, and we're going to answer the question, what happens at the end? And so if, you're, if you have your Bibles, would you stand with me? Um, we're going to be reading uh, lengthy passages of Scripture, uh, but I promise you can be seated after this for the next 29 minutes and 42 seconds, and it'll be good. Um, and if you're ever wondering why we stand for the reading of God's Word, uh, literally when they would gather together um, as far back as you can uh, trace it, they'd open up the, the Scriptures, they would stand for the reading of God's holy word in honor of his word, and then they'd sit and hear the scriptures explained. And so 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, starting at verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord." Go with me to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say on, to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day, thank you for your presence that's already in the room. Father, I pray like never before that you would give me clear words, and I pray that our ears will be open and our hearts would be ready to receive what you would say today in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, you know, I feel like I tell you guys interesting uh, travel stories all the time. This is not one that's on me today. Um, but, you know, Thursday was a normal day. Everything was going well, exciting times. And then Friday morning, I woke up to the most interesting news. Out of nowhere, it seemed like the world technology had shut down. I mean, friends of mine were taking pictures in their cubicles with blue screens because their computers weren't working. The air traffic control couldn't talk to each other. What was just working hours ago, at a snap of a finger, stopped working. All over the world, banking, uh, banking systems had issues. The London Stock Exchange had issues. All over the world, in a blink, it seemed like everything changed. Do you know, friends, in the same way, when Jesus comes again, everything is going to change. Last week, we talked about whether or not this is the end, and we, we, we're not sure. Every generation thinks their generation is the end, but we do believe, based on Scripture, we are closer than we've ever been. And in our biblical passages today, there are two specific things happening. In the first passage, this is 1 Thessalonians, uh, this is the church of Thessalonica, I'm saying it wrong, whatever, y'all know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it's these people Paul was writing to, right? 
people Paul was writing to, and while he was writing to them, there was a big theological disruption that happened. See, this is the earliest of Paul's letters, as close as you can get to after Jesus had risen from the grave and ascended into heaven, and they thought Jesus was coming back the next week. Literally, they thought, okay, he's just going, getting everything ready, and he's going to come back for us. They told everybody they could about Jesus, and they waited. A week goes by. A year goes by. Five years go by. 20 years go by, and then people start dying. And they are having a challenge because Jesus was going to come back and take us. What happens to the people who have died? And Paul writes to them and says, I, I, I need you to understand something. That those who die are not lost. The, the, see, the church in that day, they were grieving because they thought if those people died, then they would not taste eternity with the Lord. And he said, no, no, I need you to understand that the dead in Christ are going to experience eternity before we do. Here's what scripture says. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That the moment you close your eyes on this side, if you believe in Jesus, the next time you open your eyes, you're going to see what you have never seen before. Now, the other part of the passage, though, in Matthew is Jesus laying out what happens at the end of all things. And, you know, it, honestly, every generation has thought their generation was going to be the last one. Every generation. In fact, uh, my grandmother, she's watching right now. Uh, we don't have many baby pictures of my mama because she said, Jesus about to come. What's the point? I'm going to see, you know. Right? Listen, Jesus could come tomorrow. I'm taking all the pictures of I can of my babies. Every generation thought they were going to be the last one. And here's the danger, friends. God did not want us to become obsessed, but he wanted us to be aware. And if we're not careful, we'll make an idol of knowing and an idol of prophecy instead of being children of God who are focused on Jesus instead of some other thing. Do you know, making an idol out of a good thing makes it a bad thing in your life. And so... He, he tells us so that we can be aware, but not to be obsessed. And I, I just want to give you some clarity. I, I'm not going to argue with those who think pre-trib, post-trib, um, mid-trib. Mid if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. Don't worry about it, right? Here, here's what I'm going to tell you. Is here's what the scripture says about when everything ends. Here, here are four sober and truths. Number one, the end begins with the second coming of Jesus Christ. I, I, I know we, we don't really talk about this as much anymore, but I need you to know that there is a day coming where Jesus is going to crack the sky and he's going to return. The difference is the first time Jesus came, he came as a suffering servant. He came at, at, as a lamb. This time he is coming as ruler, king, and judge. He is coming with all authority and all power to transform and make right what has been wrong. I, I want you to hear the scripture. It says in Matthew 25 and 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Here, here, here's Jude 1, 14 and 15. It says, it was also said about these, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all. Friends, God is love. Don't get it twisted. He is love, but the number one attribute of God is his holiness. 
He is holy. Literally in heaven, here's what they do. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They, they, they echo. It's almost like um, a pickleball, right? They're just saying it back and forth to each other. Holy, 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 holy. The, the entire time, they are declaring the reality of who God is. And in his holiness, as much as he loves us, there is righteousness and judgment. And when he comes this time, he comes to judge the earth. So when Christ comes, that is the signal and signification that this is the end. Here's the second sobering truth, friends, is that death is not the end, it's a doorway. I, I, I need you to know, I, when I was growing up, they used to have this term YOLO, right? That's a lie. You don't, YOLO means you only live once, but friends, you actually live twice. And this life is just a small part of the real life that God has intended for you. I know sometimes you sense, all right, the finality of death, but I need you to understand that de death isn't final. Every single person will be raised from the dead. I, I want you to see it. 1 Corinthians 15 and 52, in a moment in the twinkling of the eye at the last trumpet for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Everybody who has ever lived and has died is going to be raised. Now, now here, here's the thing though. Where you spend the afterlife is determined by what you do with Jesus in this life. Where, <laughs> there's uh, this show I've been watching, um, don't judge me, it's called Dark Matter, and he goes into this little box, and when he gets into this box, it has a whole bunch of doors. Friends, when we die, there's only two doors. And what's on the other side of your door is determined by what you do with Jesus in this life. It's not determined by any other factor by what you do with Jesus. Here's what John 6 and 39 says. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up at the last day. Here, here's the reality. If you believe in Jesus, you will be saved. Not, not if you do all these good things, not if you check all these boxes. Literally, if you believe in Jesus, you will be saved. Now, let me be clear about framing a biblical belief. A biblical belief in Jesus is not acknowledgement of his existence. It is a confession of his lordship. Biblical belief in Jesus, and here, here's, here's the thing, um, Biblical repentance is not saying sorry. A lot of times we think, dang, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry, I don't really like the consequences of this. This made me feel bad, so I'm sorry. No, biblical repentance is this. What I did was wrong. I need to turn and go another direction. There should be fruit to your repentance. And so here's what Jesus says. I'm not going to lose any of those who put their faith and trust in me. In the book of Romans, it says those who hope in the Lord will not be disappointed. That those who put your faith in him, you're not going to be disappointed in putting your faith and trust in him because he will not lose that which is committed to him. In fact, the scripture says that he will keep that which is committed to him until the day of Jesus Christ, that you are secure. Now, when I was growing up, I literally um, thought the Lord was with a microscope looking out out of heaven, 
waiting for me to do something wrong. Boop, 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 boop. Take everybody and leave me. That, that's, that's literally what I thought. And some of you, you literally, you got saved every week. Because you thought, man, it didn't work last week. <laughs> I got to get back again. I, I, I want to put some of you at, at rest. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you are secure. Okay? You, you, you are secure. Your works don't get you into heaven. Your good deeds don't get you into heaven. And your bad deeds don't keep you out of heaven. It's Jesus that gets you into heaven, and it's your rejection of Jesus that keeps you out of heaven. <laughs> Humanity, we've got this, uh, we think the song is always about us. Honestly, even um, in worship music sometimes, We'll start singing, and it's supposed to be about him, and before you know it, we're only talking about us. We are predispositioned to always make it about us. Let me, let me help all of us. It's not about any of us. It's all about Jesus. It's him being glorified. It's him who is worthy. It's him who saves, delivers, and sets free. It's all about Jesus. The rejection of Jesus, Here, here's the reality. The scripture says, those who have done evil, John 5 and 29, they are resurrection, experience the resurrection of judgment. Now, I told you there's only two doors. Here, here's the third thing I need you to remember is that eternity apart from Jesus is hell. Eternity Apart from Jesus is hell. And I'm not speaking figuratively, although that's true too. But this is a literal place. It's, it's a literal, a real place that the presence of God is absent from. And here's what 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9 says. In flaming fire bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. And I've heard this retort. Well, if he's a good God, why does he send people to hell? And some, some of you have asked the same question. Let, let me say with clarity, God sends no one to hell. God does not remove your choice. The only way you don't go to heaven is if you reject salvation in Jesus. That's the only way. If you refuse to receive what Jesus has done, then you will experience eternity apart from him. Let me also say this. Hell was never intended for humanity. It was never built for us. It was never God's design for any human to go to hell. He never created it that way. He never designed it that way. In fact, Scripture says hell had to enlarge itself because it wasn't made for us. No, notice what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. He said, depart from me, verse 41, you curse into the eternal fire prepared, highlight that, prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't for humans. The truth is, friends, God desires nobody to go to hell. Look at 2 Peter 3 and 9. Here's what it says. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. Because some of y'all is like, dang, when is he going to come? You know, my dad, when I was growing up, 
Whenever he said, I'm five minutes away, I took my shoes off and sat back down because I knew I had about an hour. I was good. But some of, you know, when is he going to come? And they were asking the same question. And here's Peter's response. He's not being slow in his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. Listen, I like that. Anyone in the Greek means anyone. Or let me say it in another way. Anyone in the Greek means everybody. All of y'all. Your mama and them. Anyone to be destroyed. But he wants, okay, here's another one. Everyone to repent. That, that, that's as clear as it can be. God does not desire for anyone to go to hell. It's not in his makeup. He loves you and desires to be in relationship with you. But the truth of the matter is, we all deserve hell. All of us. We have earned it. You know, um, while we were in Guatemala, uh, one of the kids, uh, me and my wife's support, sponsored to go to a private school there. Um, his mom showed us his grades, and I was like, it's amazing. He earned it. Y'all, on the sin scale, we are, we are all got a 4.0 average. And some of you have been taking AP courses, and you got <laughs> above and beyond. We've earned it. We, we all. But the good news is, is that faith in Jesus is the only way to avoid a Christless eternity. Putting our faith in him. No, notice what John 3 and 18 says. Whoever believes in him, him being Jesus, is not condemned. Not whoever goes to church, whoever says the right thing, whoever pays their tithes, whoever... Uh, X, Y, and Z, whoever, no, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Hell's a real place. It's a place God does not desire for humans to go. And there is a ticket out. Here's the fourth thing, friends. Eternity with Jesus is heaven. Right? Not just figuratively, but literally. Heaven is a real place where God's glory and presence is fully revealed. Where where what we had in the garden, where we can be in communion with our creator, can be reestablished. Here, here's what Revelation 21 and 3 says. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Revelation 22, 4 and 5. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Here's what I need you to know about heaven, friends. That, you know, everybody talks about pearly gates and streets of gold, all of that, and mansion. And all. Can I, Let me just say this. Heaven is a real place that was prepared for all of humanity. That, that God literally prepared this place for humanity and he desires everyone to be there. Everyone. Here's what Jesus said in John 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that? I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again 
and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Now, John 3, 16 is probably one of the most famous passages in scripture. And I, I love John 3, 16. I, I love all scripture. Um, some of them are harder to chew than others, but I really love John 3, 17. Here's what it says. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, that through him the world might be saved. And, and, and people have tried to shrink this world to say, oh, well, it only means this people and that people. Let me tell you, when God says world, he means world. Everybody is who God wants to save. All of us. And so many of us have been running from him. And, and here's the truth that I've realized. So many of us want Jesus, but we just don't want him today. I, I, I want what Jesus has to offer, but can I just do what I want to do and then I, I'll check him out at the end. Can I tell you, tomorrow is not promised to anyone and today is the day of salvation. Don't miss this. Because your mama's faith is not going to get you in. Grandma's faith is not going to get you in. The only way to get in is to have faith in Jesus. Your personal faith with Jesus. Here's your fill in the blank, friends. Faith in Jesus is the only way to have a Christ-filled eternity. Let me tell you what the scripture says. Romans 10 and 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But, but, but preacher, you don't know. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. But I, have you seen my report card? I don't need to see it. But you know what? Since, since we're here, I wanted to be a lawyer but I'm going to swear all of y'all in. Uh, y'all going to be the witnesses and the juries. Y'all promise to, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and none but the truth, so help you God. Amen? Okay, great. So when we get to heaven, there is going to be a judge on the throne. And all of us is going to have our chance to stand in the defense box. There is a prosecutor. His name is Lucifer. And friends, he got all the evidence. You cried too much as a baby. You stole your cousin's rattle. And the laundry list goes down and down and down. When you lied, when you cheated, when you stole, when you hurt someone, when you manipulated, when you gossiped, when you were immoral, the, the list just goes down and down and down. And he's, he's got photographic evidence. He's got video evidence. And he's showing all of it to the court. And the judge is sitting there. Then your defense attorney, his name is Jesus. He shows up. And he's sitting there. And you're saying, are you going to object or something? And he just lets the list go long and long. Some of it, you're not even sure if you really did. It's tampered evidence. And he, he's sitting there. And the prosecution says, we rest our case. And he gets up and says, uh, your honor, uh, my client did it. They did all of it from A to Z. And as he is saying that, he's beginning to disrobe. He said, they did lie. They did steal. They did cheat. But your honor, I need you to look at my hands because there's nail prints in my hands. I need you to look at my back that was beaten for them. 
And there's this little clause called double jeopardy. You can't punish somebody else for someone else who's already done the crime, done the time, and because of his blood, yes, you did it, but you've been acquitted, and his blood has given you victory. And because of him, you can spend eternity with him. Anybody glad that you've got a lawyer who will fight your case? Anybody glad that you got somebody who will step in and said, yeah, they did it, but I've acquitted them. I've paid the price for their sin so that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And see, if you've ever been in a place where you've messed up, you can thank God for his forgiveness. You can thank God for his saving power. But though I was dirty, he washed me white as snow. There's forgiveness. And that forgiveness is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. Stop searching everywhere else. Stop trying to do it in other things. It can only be found in Jesus. And some of you, the enemy has tried to convince you that it will never be enough. I, I come to declare to you this morning that the blood is enough. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. No matter where you find yourself, he can reach you right where you are. Now here's what I say. Choose today whom you will serve. Will you church, serve yourself and reject God and spend eternity away from him. And here, here's the challenge. Some of us, it's hard. When I even start thinking about eternity, my mind, you know, I'm just like, I'll worry about that when I get there. It's hard to comprehend because we live in finite times. But eternity is forever. Forever, ever? Forever, ever. You got to decide, will you choose Jesus or will you choose other things? And today, my encouragement to you is choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray, friends. And if you have never felt the conviction of God, I pray today you feel the holy conviction of God. Not condemnation. Here's what condemnation does, wants to push you down. Here's what conviction does, it wants to call you up. Some of you, and I, and I said it last week and I just feel a burden for it. Some of you, you are culturally Christian. You, you do church, but you haven't put your faith in Jesus. Today is the day that it becomes real for you. Some of you, you you know you need to make it right with the Lord. I've been distant. Today is the day that you say yes. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word that has been declared through this flawed and broken vessel that you take these words and anoint them, empower them, and use them to make a difference. And I pray, God, that it has been clear and that you would draw humanity to you. God, I pray for the lost, for the broken. I pray for those who are far and those who are near. I pray today would be their day of salvation. And if that's you, I want you to pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, save me. Change me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I put my faith in you. Jesus, I believe in you. Make me new. And Father, I just pray over your people. I pray, God, in the midst of every fight and every battle, we will be reminded of the reality of heaven that some glad morning when this life is over, we will fly away. That there is a day coming that our best life will be with you for eternity, God. That we will experience your glory and your power, God. I pray that you would give us a taste of it even now, God, that your presence would be near and clear to us, God. That we will be a church, God, 
that pursues your face, that we will be a church that bows before you and gives you glory and honor, that we will be a place, God, where your glory remains and resides. We will be a place where people find hope and find forgiveness and freedom and they find Jesus, that you will be the prize, you will be the hope of glory and we will give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' mighty name we pray and every heart say amen.